but now that everybody is ready, uh, with no further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Kelly Robinson. She'll be talking about, to us about what if we had TLS for phone numbers. Hello. Thank you. Awesome. So who's gotten a spam call this week? Who's gotten one today? Awesome. You get a prize from me if one goes off during this, uh, this, this talk. Like, I don't know, you win something. I don't know what it is yet, but you win something. This is an actual picture of my missed calls from this month. I mean, this is a problem that I know is not unique to me. In fact, every person in the U.S. gets about 14 unwanted calls every month alone for upwards of 54.6 billion calls in 2009. And you might notice that some of these, if you can see on the bottom, are actually flagged as potential spoofing, and that's cool, but one of the things that the interest industry has started thinking about is, what if we could mark these as not just spam, but like the reverse of that? What if we could mark calls as trusted? What if we could say that calls are verified? We already do this with websites. We already do this with emails. Why can't we do this for phone numbers? And the short answer is that we can. And I'm going to be telling you about this TLS, Transport Layer Security-like technology, uh, that we're using and implementing to solve the call authentication problem. It's called Shake and Stir. And we'll be diving into what this is going to do, the history of telephony security, uh, some definitions and technical details of the actual spec. Uh, and then what the U.S. specifically is going to do to enforce implementation of this new technology. And finally, where the limitations are and what you can do as consumers and as security professionals to mitigate the damage from spam calls in the meantime. So my name is Kelly Robinson. I work at Twilio. Twilio, if you are not familiar, does do things around the telephony API uh, space. And so specifically, I work on Twilio's APIs for two-factor authentication. Twilio acquired Authy about five years ago. Uh, and so I work at kind of this interesting intersection of telephony security and like consumer security. And so that's why I started getting interested in this topic. And let's talk about what telephony security means, right? Like this is in quotes intentionally because there isn't a ton of security in the telephony network right now. Uh, when telephony got started like hundreds, over 100 years ago, there was a monopoly of companies. It was AT&T, Bell Labs, whatever you want to call it for like the majority of the early history. And even as recent as 30 years ago, the network basically looked like this. It was private, it was closed. We were using a lot of proprietary technology, and there was just a few companies that all trusted each other. And so much like the early days of the internet, there wasn't really this idea or this need for a secure layer transport or anything like that. People were just kind of like, I know who's talking to me. I know who's sending me this data. I know there's only so many people that can actually access this network, so I don't need to worry about adding any security uh, into the network right now. <laughs> Compare that to today, there's thousands of companies, thousands of service providers that provide access to the telephony network in the US alone, and it's relatively easy to access. And also now there's a lot of standard technology built on top of the internet that allows people to more easily access the network. And there's so many potential paths for a call, and a lot of this you can think of the difference between like accessing the telephony network between 30 years ago and today. It's very similar to how you deploy code today versus 30 years ago. Like today you have AWS, you even have services as easy as Netlify. Like you don't actually have to know anything about the underlying server in order to get code onto the internet or your application on the internet. And telephony is very similar. You can place phone calls into the public network without actually having to know things about the underlying network technology there. So before we get into this, I have to give a little bit more context on telephony jargon. Like who here thinks that they know things about telephony? Okay, that's like 10% of you, if that. Uh, so bear with me. The PSTN, the publicly switched telephony network, this is background knowledge for the rest of you. This is things like cellular networks, undersea fiber cables, copper telephone lines. This is what allows people across the globe to talk to each other on the telephony network. One that you might be a little bit more familiar with, VoIP, voice over internet protocol. And this is what a lot of mobile uh, infrastructure and businesses are using now, but this is relatively new technology. And uh, SIP is the session initiation protocol, and so this is a way of initiating VoIP calls and other types of 
uh, VoIP communications. It doesn't just have to be calling. Uh, SIP is kind of like an HTTP request, uh, but for phone calls in that it like contains metadata about the request. It has some information about where the call is coming from who the call is going to, uh, and things like that. And this is important to mention because Shaken and Stir, the uh, solution that we're going to be talking about, only is going to apply to SIP-initiated phone calls. And then finally, we have this concept called a PBX, or a private branch exchange. Any of you like manage your company's PBX? Oh, used to, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a little bit outdated. The people that manage PBXs might know more about uh, those than, uh, than we can get into on this stage right now. But uh, these are a private uh, enterprise network for people to talk just within their companies. Uh, and so that this is not connected to the PSTN, uh, except for at a few access points. And so the, the problem that we have today is kind of what we outlined in the beginning, is that it's gotten really easy and really a lot more common to spam people in the last five or 10 years, and there's a few main reasons for this. And so there's a lot of cheap dialers out there, and I mentioned that there's over 4,000 service providers in the US alone that allow you to initiate a call into the PSTN. And the other big problem right now is, especially for SIP-initiated calls, there's not actually any validation on who the call is coming from. And that is up to right now to the service provider to decide whether or not they want to enforce if you have access to that phone number. So on the right there is an app that I downloaded <laughs> on an iOS device. And so this is not like a jailbroken device or anything like that. It's just an app available in the App Store that without any knowledge of SIP, any user can go out there and decide to spoof a phone number and just say, that, like, oh, I want to make a call to this number from the number that I give you, and they let you do it. So I don't know what this uh, app is using under the hood, but it's one way that people have access to the PSTN and allows you to make spoof calls without doing any validation or really having any technical know-how. So the follow-up question that we get a lot is, like, why is this even legal? Like, what is the reason that we aren't just, like, banning this technology? And unfortunately, there's, like, some historic legitimate use cases for this, and this is why I brought up PBXs. And so what used to happen is it used to be really expensive for companies to get access to the PSTN, and so they would build these private networks internally. And, you know, these are, like, large enterprise companies that needed to have thousands of phone lines for their employees. And if their employees were mostly talking to each other, it was cheaper for them to build that internal network and then allow only a couple of access points out to customers or out to the actual public network. And what they would do then is if I get an incoming call, it might come directly to me from my extension, but then if I want to call out to a customer, say I work in customer support, what it's doing is the PBX will actually spoof the front number to be like that company's customer support number so that they can see that, oh, this is actually like insert company X here that's calling me back so that if I need to then call them back, I have the com cus company's customer support number in my call history. And this is a very similar use case that a lot of doctor's offices and hospitals were using and so that that was something that they could do that a doctor would then, if the doctor needed to call out from the doctor's office from a personal phone number, what he could then do is then get a call back to the main office line, and then the office line would have the ability to either connect you to the doctor on call or do something like get the main office for scheduling questions. And we did introduce legislation to address this, and so in 2009, we had the Truth and Caller ID Act. This was something that kind of came up as people were getting a lot more spam calls. But we couldn't completely ban them because of those like legitimate use cases. And unfortunately, a lot of those PBX networks, like some people have moved off of them onto more VoIP systems. And you can have VoIP PBX systems, but there's still a lot of hardwired technology out there that people are still using. And so we're not like able to completely move off of those, even in 2009. <laughs> And so there's also this enforcement struggle with this, right? Like, because there's so many hops in the telephony network to get from point A to point B, you might not have a direct line between the person who places the call and the person who receives the call. And so in order to trace back that caller, you might have to go through like a dozen service providers in order to get to the originating service provider that spoofed the original call. And so tracking this down takes time. It takes effort, and therefore it takes money. And so the FCC right now is really only going after the most egregious of uh, bad actors. And so that brings us to these solutions. And so uh, Shakenster is like the egregious backronym crime. Uh, so Shaken is signature-based handling of asserted information using tokens. 
Uh, STIR is Secure Telephony Identity Revisited. I think STIR came first, um, but it gets worse, so they, they've extended this. There's now an extension proposal for Lemon Twist. I'm not even gonna let you read that, it's too bad. <laughs> but as the FCC describes it, calls would have their caller ID signed as legitimate by originating carriers and validated by other carriers before reaching consumers. And so what this is doing is we're using well-accepted web authentication technologies that have been employed in other use cases to use public key infrastructure to sign calls as legitimate, to sign calls as trusted. And so the person originating the call would sign that with a private key, and other calls in the network, other service providers in the network would have access to their public key to verify that that call was from who they said it was from. And so we're not reinventing the wheel here. It's using PKI, it's using certificates, it's using JSON web tokens. And if you're familiar with the way that email verifies from sender IDs and does sender authentication, this is very similar to emails DKIM and DMARC. So this is a very simplified view of the end-to-end -end system. Uh, there is a signing service that includes the PKI management from the originating service provider. Like I mentioned, the originating service provider is the people that have to do the key management. Uh, you know, one of the arguments against shake and stir is that like PKI is hard and like, you know, that might be true, but I think I heard that from a person that provides PKI consulting, so like that might not be <laughs> the biggest thing that we have to worry about. Uh, and also in, in, you know, in perspective, there's also only about like 4,000 service providers in the US. And so the number of public keys that you need to maintain as a service provider is like comparatively low than what a lot of other people that are doing uh, you know, that kind of infrastructure management have to deal with. There is a limited number of services uh, out there. Uh, the certificate authorities I do want to try attention to as well, and so these are being chosen right now by ATIS. I think there's going to be seven in total. Um, they've announced at least two, uh, which is Newstar and TransNexus, and so these are companies that deal with like phone numbers uh, in, in the data with phone numbers uh, as their trade, and so I think there's others that have been chosen but maybe not publicly announced, and ATIS is the one that is doing this, and they are the standards body that authored Shaken, and so this is the technology um, service uh, uh, telephone industry standards body that is uh, making a lot of this uh, 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 the the shaken spec. Uh, and then also on the right there, it's going to be up to the client. So this is like Apple or Google, closely in partnership with people like AT&T and Verizon and T-Mobile and Comcast, uh, in order to dis ha decide how to display that the calls are trusted. And so a couple of ways that they could do that, they could have check marks, they could have something that says a verified caller, um, you could have locks like we have in like uh, web browsers. But similarly to how like Firefox and Chrome display HTTPS differently, uh, this is going to be up to the end client to decide how to display this. And while Shaken is a standard, deciding how to display trust to the end user is not something that has been standardized. So as a reminder, SIP is a way of originating voice, VoIP calls into the telephony network, and I wanna talk a little bit about the new identity header that's being introduced as part of this. And so this is what a SIP header looks like currently. You can see some of the metadata included there. I highlighted the from number, and this is what uh, can currently be spoofed if the service provider isn't uh, validating that you are sending a, a, or starting a SIP call from a number that you have access to. So what Shaken does is it introduces a new identity header, and this is in the form of a base64 encoded JSON web token. And I'm gonna uh, focus on the information that's encoded in the middle section there, because there's a lot of stuff that we could go through. Uh, and so the information that's included here is an attestation level, which I'll talk more about on the next slide. It includes information about who the call is going to, uh, who placed the call, the time that the call was placed, and most interestingly is the ridge ID, and and so this is going to be set by the originating service provider to denote who the underlying customer is. And so if you're Comcast and you have, you know, Kelly Inc. that's placing the call, Comcast would set the orig ID to some UUID that they've decided they can trace back to me. And this is what's going to make it possible to do quick and fast and very uh, painless enforcement of things like the Truth and Caller ID Act because uh, the service provider has a trace back to who was placing that call and because this uh, header is going to be included all the way through end-to-end uh, -end in the call transfer. 
And so there's three attestation levels that are included. Uh, and the originating service provider is like putting their reputation on the line here by uh, denoting which attestation level they want to associate with that caller. Uh, and so only the attestation level A is probably what's going to be displayed as some kind of check mark or verified caller. But even all the way down to attestation level C, this is not the service provider saying that like, I think this is spam. It's just them saying, like, I don't have as much trust in this call. Uh, you know, I might not know who the customer is or that they have access to the number, but they're still giving some level of attestation that they know that they are responsible for placing this call. So a shake and sign call is far less likely to be a fraudulent call uh, than anything that isn't signed with this identity header. So new technology is great, but we need to make sure that people are actually implementing it. And the main way that we're going to do this is with the Trace Act. And this is really interesting because you might have heard about this, but it was signed into law just over a month ago at the very end of 2019. But it was passed into law, uh, or it was passed by the Senate last May. And so there's been articles in the uh, headlines about this for a couple of years now because they've been debating this. This technology is not brand new, but it hasn't been enforced yet. And so what the trace law does is it allows for a $10,000 fine, and it also requires that telecom companies implement call authentication in the next 18 months. And I think that's where this gets interesting, uh, because call authentication is going to mean a couple of different things. Uh, for VoIP uh, authentication, it's, you need to implement shake and, sh shake and stir. That's what it means for call authentication for VoIP calls. For non-VoIP calls, uh, reasonable measures to implement call authentication. Uh, so they acknowledge that there isn't as good of a system for non-VoIP calls yet, but uh, companies like Newstar have a solution called Stir Out of Band. So if you are still running like a PBX that's non-VoIP, you uh, might want to look into that to comply with the Trace Act. Uh, and of course, like technology like this is not perfect, and this isn't going to solve all of the uh, problems that we have with spammers. And as my coworker Randy likes to say, one of the limitations here is that the, the, the phone network is an ungodly beast, right? Uh, this is something that's been around for over 100 years and something that's kind of just like grown organically. And part of this ungodly beast is this fun thing called time division multiplexing, uh, which is you know a fun word that you all knew you wanted to learn today. Uh, so this is called TDM, and these are physical switches used by the PSTN. It's essentially the complete opposite of VoIP, old school hardware, been around for over 50 years, and it's baked into a lot of enterprise PBXs. Uh, but people like TDM because the call quality is really good, and so even though VoIP is sometimes cheaper, now people aren't always eager to move off of TDM systems. And then there's a few other considerations that we need to make, things like what happens when phone numbers get dis disconnected, what happens when they get ported or reassigned. Uh, you know, this is a major problem in the US. Everything that I talked about, the enforcement is going to happen in the US. But I know this is a problem in the UK. I know this is a problem in Norway. Uh, this is not just a problem here. The technology could be international, but the enforcement hasn't been yet. And we do really need like the network to buy in in order for the system to work. And then finally, there's other communication channels that use phone numbers like text messages, and this right now is mostly just applying to phone calls. So like I mentioned, the FCC's number one complaint is robocalls. They're really invested in fixing this because they don't really want to deal with these complaints anymore. As divided as like our country's government is right now, the Trace Act passed with about 100% support, so it wasn't really a controversial bill to get through. Uh, we'll see this start to get enforced towards the end of 2020 and into 2021 is probably when you can start to see changes. Uh, for all of you that are working on security solutions at your companies right now, there's some ap applications and security mitigations that you can take, things like protecting your phone numbers from web scraping bots, using actual call authentication in your call centers. Uh, there's things like voice captures that you can use instead of visual captures to hopefully catch bots and scammers in your call centers for that. And as, in terms of consumer mitigations, there's apps out there like Haya, RoboKiller. You might have heard of some of these. Haya has a partnership with AT&T now, so some of these might start to be baked into your carrier. Um, use those at your own risk. Some of them want to take over as your primary dialer, especially if you have Android phones. So, you know, make sure you read the terms and conditions. Uh, and then finally, educate your family and friends. This is something that, like, the IRS doesn't need to call you and get your information from you. Uh, this is not something that, you know, any member of your family, your aging grandfather, needs to be answering that call. So educate your family and friends about the dangers of call spam, and hopefully they won't need to learn about that after the next 18 months. 
So telephony is a complicated system, and I think that shake and stir is a really good starting point for us building solutions and rebuilding trust in the telephony network. It's not a perfect solution, but we're out here to start rebuilding that trust. And it's a lot like the email situation now. We still have a spam problem, but it's much easier to manage now that we have sender authentication. And I think we'll start to see that much easier to manage as soon as Shake and Stir gets implemented network-wide. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm about out of time, but I'm going to be out in the hall right after this. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for coming to ShmooCon. Once again, my name is Kelly Robinson, and thank you for listening. <laughs>